Welcome everyone, it's been a while. Please sign in, let us know where you are from. Praise God. Patricia is from Canada, our sister from Canada. God bless you. We have quite a few sisters that watch us from Canada. And we're so grateful for each and every one of you. I've been praying for your nation that God would do a, a change and let your people go so that you can leave your borders and come and be with us at these convergences. And we may be able to be come up into Canada without all of these restrictions and stuff. But praise God. Praise the Lord. It's so good to be with you this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. So we are back from our divine convergence in Colorado. It was tremendously powerful. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Uh, Sister Gloria from Colorado, God bless you. She was able to go to both of the convergence here in Florida and the one in, in Colorado. And so it's good to see you. Amen. Good to be with you. Praise, praise God. This Thursday, just to let you know, Thursday night, well, people sign in at seven o'clock, we're going to have a special broadcast. Um, and it's going to be um, from, from um, transitioning from the church age to the kingdom age, the function of a divine convergence. And so if you're interested in finding out exactly what a convergence is and why this is such an important uh, tool that God is using to take us out from the church age to the kingdom age, and really be able to minister to the Lord. Um, I really encourage you to watch this broadcast Thursday night at seven o'clock. I'm asking people who came to the convergences to join me um, and share. Uh, Nicole was at our convergence in, in, Col in Colorado, so hopefully she can join us on, on Thursday night as well. And may good morning, Nicole. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Just like everyone, just uh, if you would to uh, pray, I'm gonna pray in just a couple of minutes here for Reverend Lynn. She's going in for minor back surgery today. She's gonna be overnight and be released tomorrow, but we're gonna, if you would remember to pray for her today. And also for uh, Reverend Dolores uh, Giles, who's been recuperating from her uh, her situation. She's doing much better, but we need to keep both of these precious sisters in prayer, amen. So Father, we thank you this morning and we praise you and we bless you and we glorify your name. Lord, I thank you this morning that in weakness you are strong. And I thank you that you remember what but dust, Lord. And so we come before you, Lord. Lord, I pray with a broken heart and a humble spirit, relying on you, trusting on you for everything, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Where would we be without you, Lord? Where would we go without you? Nowhere, Lord. We'd be no one. So we acknowledge you this morning, Lord. We acknowledge your presence, Lord. We welcome you. We welcome your manifested presence to fill every house. Lord, that you would reveal yourself in a very special way, in a real way, a tangible way, Lord, to all that are watching this broadcast, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord. Lord, you told me not to advertise it, so I'm not, Lord or to do anything, Lord, but just to broadcast and that you would take it and bring it to those that you would want to in the nations and the cities and the states, Lord, and countries, Lord, by your hands. So Holy Spirit, I thank you that right now that you would draw those that you want to watch this broadcast to this broadcast. You know how to get them there, Lord. You know how to get them to find it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'll, that you'll move, Father, and bring those that are supposed to watch it now live and maybe later, Lord, and recording, Lord. For those that are hungering and thirsting, Lord, for you, for your presence, for your manifested presence, for your glory. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We know you, but we want to know you better. We hear you, and we want to hear you better. We see you, Lord, but we want to see you better. So open our eyes to see you like we've never seen you before. Open our ears to hear you like we never heard you before. Open our hearts to understand your ways like we never understood them before. We cling to you this morning, Lord. And Lord, we pray for our sister Lynn today, Lord, that you would be with her, that you would guide the doctors and the nurses, Lord, that they do exactly and better than anything they could ever hope for or thought, Lord. Lord, I thank you that, that your angels would surround her, Lord, that you would protect her, cover in your blood, Lord, as she goes through the surgery, Lord, let your angels fill that room, Lord. I thank you that your ministering angels be sent to help, Lord, in any ways that's needed, Lord. Let your peace come upon my sister, upon Tom, Lord. Father, as, as the surgeons do the surgery, Lord, and I pray, Father God, that you would just come 
and minister to, to her, Lord. Even while she's sleeping, Lord, that you would speak to her and minister to her. When she wake up, Lord, Lord, that she'd be pain free. She recuperate, Lord, almost instantaneously, that they would be amazed that your glory would be seen. We pray for her today. We thank you for healing her, and thank you for fixing her back, and thank you for Dolores, Lord, and for Lord for touching her and bringing her back to full health. And we pray for all those that are sick today, Lord, that everyone that needs your healing power touch them, heal them, set them free today, Lord. You know what the symptoms are in each body. You know, Lord, that you are our healer. So we pray your healing power, your strength to fill those that need healing today. Those that need to walk in divine health, let divine health come forth today, Lord, and manifest in each body. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yanelda, God bless you. Katie, thank you for joining. Gloria, all of you that are on this morning. Well, we're going to begin a new series today um, called um, uh, Unfolding Glory 2, or Glory Unfolding 2, the glory of the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Now, I pray, that I'm really praying, and I hope you pray with me, that pastors and prophets and evangelists and teachers and apostles will be drawn to this video because I think this is a very important series of, of, of God's unfolding plans that will help the church transition out and of the finished church age into the kingdom age. And David's tabernacle is one of the most important works of restoration that the Lord has to bring to his people right now to release his glory, his glory. The glory that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 60, arise and shine for the light is come and the glory of the Lord shall be what's seen risen upon thee. Now, what this broadcast is going to be about is sharing with you the realm of God's glory and the work of David's tabernacle. Now, at our divine convergences and before that, but especially at the divine convergences, the ministry to the Lord himself has been the key. Now, I don't know why the Lord asked me to do it this way, you know, but he did. He, he, back last year, back in November or October, he spoke to me, he said, I want you to begin to have converted divine convergences. I said, what's that, Lord? He said, it's just a place to come and seek my face. No agenda, no blueprints, no plans. Okay, just me. And that I'm going to gather a people who are hungry and thirsty to be with me. I'm going to gather my singers, my musicians, my dancers, my flag ministries, right? The dancers. Uh, the the music the minstrels the musicians the scribes the prophetics the prophetic apostolic the bible ministries the handmaidens and maids of the, and I'm going to draw them to come together spontaneously throughout the land to meet with me and I'm going to come and I'm going to reveal myself in my glory in different ways that is going to prepare knit and bring my body together that's what he told me and that's beginning to happen we're seeing it. Now, I'm going to focus uh, a lot of, especially these beginning uh, teachings on the, on, the, on the need for David's tabernacle. I'm going to give some historical content to it and also some, uh, some other things that I've gleaned from others that have a perspective on this, like from my spiritual fathers and others that have shared. So I'll be sharing some materials for them, as well as what God has been giving me that I think go hand in hand with what the Lord is doing. But I, 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 I want you to understand that in in March 2020, the whole world stopped. God stopped everything. All the church activities, all the busyness, we could do nothing. And basically, we were alone with the Lord. And that was by design. That was a stop sign. That was a wake-up call. That was the dawning and the birthing of the kingdom age coming into the light. Up until up until 2020, the, it, it's been the kingdom age. But if you just like at midnight, from midnight to about 6 o'clock, it's still dark out. And you can hardly tell it's a new day. But then the sun comes up on the horizon and boom, you know it's daytime. That's exactly what happened in 2020 as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. It became daytime. And many, many people are beginning to experience kingdom reality, the kingdom of God reality versus the church reality. And so many had prophesied this. Many pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers have spoken of, of, of a new wineskin coming and the need of a new wineskin and not doing business as usual. And the new wineskin wine came. That new wineskin required us to burn the ships of how we how we ministered in the past, how we how we how we did uh, services in the past, 
meetings in the past, conferences in the past, gatherings in the past, outreaches. The Lord wanted it all to be laid on the altar, to be tested by fire. So that which he wanted to continue would remain and that which needed to stop would stop. We needed to burn the ships. Now, many of you have done that. Many of you have left that system, the church age system, the religious system. And I'm gonna show you through scriptures why why, why this is so necessary. We're gonna take a look later on, especially in Hebrews chapter nine, what an important, what an important um, uh, uh, chapter of scripture that, ta- that points to this age that we're in right now, about the changing of the garden, the changing of worship and the worship that needs to leave the holy place ministry, which we've done in the church age. I'm gonna talk about that in this broadcast, about what it is, what services are, where they came from, why we do them, and the change from, from service to convergence, from service to convergence to David's tabernacle. And if you don't have a, a clear understanding of why the Lord in, in Amos 9-11 says, in that day, what day? This day. I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up the ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord. The tabernacle of David, notice what it's going to do. It's going to, it's a place for the end time harvest to come into those souls that have not been saved. And those that need to come in the fullness of God are going to come not to a church service, not to a church meeting as we've known them to be, not even to conferences, but those that are going to be called to the kingdom and to come into a, a new structure, a kingdom structure, a kingdom structure of gatherings, a kingdom structure of gatherings where the seeking of God is first and paramount. That is the first and only agenda is seeking the face of God and why that is so important. And that's what we have to look at. Why is that so important to the Lord? A lot of people think this is just my opinion, but it's not. This is the word of God. This is what God said. And many others are seeing this. And many people are beginning to have spontaneous meetings where they just wait on the Lord. They don't do anything but wait and then worship. You know, uh, my, my daughter was sharing with me the other day. She was watching a uh, service and the pastor was desperate for more of the Lord. And they had about 15, 20 minutes of worship. It was on it was on uh, uh, on FaceTime on uh, Facebook. And he said, oh, I wish we could just stay in the worship of the Lord. I wish we could just stay here. But but he didn't know that he could because that's what the church teaches us. So you can't you have to have a set time of worship. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, whatever you call it. And then we pick the songs. Okay. And then we go from the then we go from the worship to the announcements. Or I call them the commercials. From the commercials, then we then we have to pray for the for the for the um uh offering. And then after the offerings received, we 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 do a uh, uh, the, the preacher preaches for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we pray with people. See, it's a pattern of worship. David changed the pattern of worship. He changed the pattern of worship from Moses' tabernacle to establish a new order of worship. So important that the Lord said that that pattern of worship needs to be restored in that day. What day? In the day of the Lord, it has to be restored. And so that's what we're going to begin to look at in this broadcast. Now, if you're looking for a 20-minute broadcast, you're looking at the wrong place. I'm not a 20-minute preacher. Call me long-winded, whatever you want to say. It doesn't matter to me. Because I'm not my this message that God has given me and the word that God is having me share may not be for everybody. It's you know, and maybe this is not something that is for 20 minutes. So, you know, we're going to spend some time on this as long as necessary. You know, it might be an hour, could be just a few more minutes past that. But, you know, or or whatever, whatever time the Lord desires for me to share, that's what we're going to do. And I realize that that many people have things to do and have to leave and this and they don't want to sit and listen to somebody for an hour or more that's okay then god will bring them somewhere else but for those of you that are out there and and facebook land (laughs) or youtube land that are desperate for the lord the time won't make a difference to you because you're hungry and you're thirsty and you're ready to sit and 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 receive the Lord together. You see, this this broadcast is us learning together. It's not me trying to share with everybody. It's the Lord teaching all of us together, experiencing it together, walking in it together as one people of God. That's what we're doing. I'm just a messenger, you know. And the Lord is a message. So praise God. It says, and they that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that does. 
does this. It is so important that, that in Acts chapter 15, verse 15 through 7, let me just bring my note papers up a little bit closer. You know, okay. And Acts 15, uh, 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 and, and to this agree the words of the prophets that is written. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who does all these things. <clears throat> if there is a time in history where we need the full manifestation of the tabernacle of David worship, it's now, it's now. We have tried to change spiritual atmospheres over cities through intercession, through warfare, through many different ways, means. And if you take a look at it, the nations aren't necessarily getting much better. So what does the Lord want to do to change the kingdoms of this world into the kingdoms of our God in Christ? And how will he spoil principalities and powers and actually bring them down over regions, over cities, over territories, over nations? It starts with the formation of David's tabernacle. It starts with the rebuilding of David's tabernacle. If you are a Bible minister, I implore you to search the scriptures. I implore you to see that every time God wants to bring restoration to a nation, into the nation of Israel, the first thing they did was to remove the idols, tear down the idols and all the objects of worship in the, in the, in the temple of God, and they restored David's tabernacle of worship. Why? Because ministry to the Lord is our first work. Because if he's our first love, it's our first work. And because the church and the church age has become more work orientated than God seeking orientated, the, the need for true and pure worship is not seen as valued or really needed. I was taught you worship the Lord to prepare people for the word. How many of you pastors know what I'm talking about? Weren't you taught that? That, that worship prepares us for the word, for the message. I taught that and I believed it. Until one day the Lord rebuked me and he said, don't ever say that again. He said, That's right. Do you hear me? He said, don't ever say that again. He said, worship is not to prepare you for the word. I am the word. Worship is for me. And I'm gathering together to minister to my heart so that I can be with you and you will be with me. See, we don't really have that priority. We don't have that mindset when we come in our gatherings together. We have no concept of that. We are really coming to be with the Lord. We say it, but we're not coming to be with the Lord at all in our services. We're coming to hear a message. It's very little experiencing of God is there. Very little experiencing of people intimately touching God, hearing God, seeing God, knowing God. It's become a religious form instead of a reality of God of experience the Lord. That's why convergence is, and if, you'll hear this Thursday, but if, even if you go back and listen to some of the testimonies on Facebook and YouTube, you will hear that the people who came met God face to face. They met the Lord personally. They were changed by the Lord personally. They heard the Lord personally, and we heard the Lord collectively. Isn't that what a gathering is supposed to be about? Where we hear each person hears God for themselves, and then we hear God collectively. And then through the, the ministry gifts that God's given us, God speaks and moves in power and the body builds itself up in love. Now, I don't know why that's not appealing to you, to most of the apostles, pastors, preachers, teachers, evangelists, why we still have to have this mindset that we've got to preach. It's the one guy or we said, or the big guys and all the, you know, and everybody else listens. And the church structure, what we have today is that we, and the conferences, it's we, the FIFO ministries, do all the teaching, teaching and talking and imparting, and you sheep listen, take notes and do it. I'm going to be fr quite frank with you. Most of the notes that people take, they never even go back and go over them again. Ask them. They don't. They have begun, they've become great note takers, but they have not experienced the reality of the Lord. Because the system that we have built, the system that's in place, doesn't allow us to experience God fully. Now, there are different house, there are not everywhere. There are house churches, there are churches 
that flow with that spirit of God, move in the spirit of God, allow the Lord to move. And, you know, um, but, you know, but in, in many cases, they still have to have somebody preach the message. We need to replace that thinking about receiving a message instead of receiving the messenger. We are looking for the messenger, the Lord whom you seek, the messenger of the new covenant, Malachi 3. He shall come. And who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? But when he comes, he's going to come like a refiner's fire and full of soap. How many of your gatherings or services you have felt him there as a refining fire that you could move? Or full of soap that people are crying, weeping, being changed and transformed by God's glory. Nobody laying hands on them. Nobody praying over them. Not that we can't do that, but God himself meeting with his people. I believe Five phone ministers out there, you really want that because so do I. I did. But we have to understand that that the Moses Tabernacle structure or the holy place structure that we've lived with has to be removed because everything now is behind the veil. It's in the holy of holies. It's in the glory realm. Our ministry is behind the veil. It's to the our ministry is to the one who sits on the throne, to, that ministers on the throne. And that's why when the Lord wanted to change the order of worship. When he wanted to establish himself a king to rule in governmental order, he chose a psalmist. He chose a worshiper. He chose a singer. He chose a musician who knew how to minister to his heart. David was a man after God's own heart. I want you to look today, pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists, those that lead worship, are they truly men and women who know how to minister the heart of God, the singers, the musicians, the dancers, the flags? Do they know how to minister to God's heart? Have they been trained by the Lord himself on what's pleasing to him? I met a sister. Her name is Candace. She's in Philadelphia. She has a flag ministry. You know, there's another group of people that I say, his name is Don Johnson. I think with the flag ministry that they travel with, but they're very rare that I've seen flag ministers who know how to minister to the heart of God with their flags. Dee Perkins in Colorado is another one. But with Sister Candace, what I had seen is that she becomes one with that flag in ways I have never seen before. I see Jesus in the flags. I see not only is she ministering to the Lord in her flag ministry, but her and the Lord are one in that flag ministry. I mean, it is so beautiful. And, you know, when, when it happens, you see the Lord and you're caught up in the Lord. You don't even see the sister waving the flags because it just enhances the atmosphere of glory. And there may be others that have that type of flag ministry. Sister Leesa, God bless you. Hallelujah. Our sister from Fiji, God bless you. Amen. But their ministry is there. I have seen musicians who can play that music, whatever they play their instrument, with such an apostolic prophetic anointing that ministers the heart of God that it brings you to tears. I've seen people sing new spontaneous songs, whether they be children or adults, that are so beautiful because they are pure worship to God. David's tabernacle brings pure worship to God and it ministers to the Lord as long as necessary. I told you, I shared the story about the, what happened in, in California in, in San Marcos. I'll never forget it. Where the children, that young girl, she was 11. She's probably in her 20s now. But she just waved her glory chaser like this and said, and with tears streaming down her eyes, she said, Jesus, what other words would you want to hear? But I love you. I love you. And she was crying and God's glory came. Are you hearing me, Bible ministers? Are you hearing me, people of God? Her pure love, her ministry to the Lord. David's tabernacle is about ministry to the Lord. It is not a song service. It is not a song service. We got to throw the song services out the window and never have them again. If you truly want to see the glory of God in your gatherings, we can't have a song service. It has to be a ministry to the Lord. And the time frame of that ministry to the Lord is as long as the Lord wants it. See, that's the other thing. In our church structure and services, we got the time clock. And that time clock is probably one of the biggest enemies to the glory being manifested in your gatherings. Why? Because with the time clock, we're looking for the end instead of the Lord. We're looking to get out. We're trying to get people to get out instead of to come. Or just come enough to get a 
a little sip, <laughs> and then leave. That is not what David's tabernacle is about. And the Lord said, the, and, and, and Amos, that in that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and is closed, and I'll close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins. That's what we, that's what the convergences really are about. When the Lord told me to do this, you know what he said? No agenda, no plan, no guest speakers. That's absurd, isn't it, Fivefold Ministers? Who has a gathering of the saints with no agenda? Not miracles, not signs, not wonders, not apostolic this, prophetic that, you know, or no guest speakers, right? No theme, except I want to meet you here and I'm going to reveal myself to you in Florida as your bridegroom in, 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 in uh, Colorado as the king of glory. And now in Plymouth, Massachusetts for six days coming up August 6th through the 11th as the Lord of hosts. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Have you ever heard? It's, it's crazy, isn't it? But for whatever reason, I want to meet you here. Notice God is taking us from location to location to location. I believe that is very strategic in the Lord. Because in each place, a divine seed is being deposited in these locations that I believe is going to bring change to our nation and to the nations. I believe others are going to begin to pick up the ball and begin to see the need of the restoration of David's tabernacle and the converging of God's people. We're going to talk, this is what we're going to cover over these how far how far however long the Lord allows me to do this series. And I believe these are critical teachings and sharings from God's heart, not me, from God's heart to us, imploring us to go behind the veil, imploring us to understand that his first our first work is to be a priest. Our first calling, he's forming us into a kingdom of kings and priests unto God. He calls us a royal priesthood in a holy nation. I, it is not working for the Lord first. It is ministering to the Lord first. Our first work when we wake up in the morning, our, our, our heart should be continually looking to minister to the heart of the Lord. He's seeking such that we'll worship him that way. The Father seeks those that will worship him in spirit and truth. What is spirit and truth? It's, it's a heart. That pants after God. God, what does David say? As the deer pants for the waters, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my, my, my strength, my shield. As the deer pants for the waters, so my soul longeth after you. How many of you are thirsting for God? How many are hungry for God? For, for God's glory to come, the restoration of David's tabernacle comes. Now, I want you to understand that when the Lord, when David established it, there was no time clock. It was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. It blows my mind. When we consider David's tabernacle, people say Kansas City IHOP or, or, or Upper Room. Those are places like that. But but most of their focus is prayer and worship to the Lord, which is wonderful. But there's so much more that's going to happen in David's tabernacle. Those are the things, the, those, the worship of the Lord and the intercession, I believe, must come be much more spontaneous. Yes, much more spontaneous. So that we have the present heart of the Lord. What is God saying now? What does God want to reveal now? They had scribes in there for a reason, to write down everything that the Lord said. <clears throat> Excuse me. The value of, 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 of David's tabernacle is that in it, the Lord is ministered to. In our gatherings, if you want to see the glory of the Lord manifest, if you want to see the supernatural miracles that you prayed for with the Lord just touching people without anybody praying over them, then he has to be acknowledged. He has to be loved, he has to be worshiped, and he has to be sought after. The priority of our gathering is not to hear a message. It is to be with the messenger, Jesus Christ. It's to be with him. Even when he chose the disciples, I just wrote a Facebook uh, post about this. Do you know when he called his disciples, you know what he did? He took the 12 and he brought them up to a high mountain. See, they had to go up that they might be with him. And then he chose them, then he sent them. 
He called them up to come. They, he called them up the mountain what, that they might be with him. Then he commissioned them and then he sent them. We've lost that in the church. The going up. David's tabernacle is the means of going up into the glory realm, into the high praises of God. What happens when you get up there? Anything God wants from worship warfare to personal intercession to declarations to whatever the Lord desires, whatever he wants to do comes from that coming up there. And David knew that. So think about it. When, when the Lord wanted to set up a governmental order, apostles hear this. When, when, the Lord, when the Lord wanted to set up governmental order over the city of Jerusalem, he went to Mount Zion. We're going to talk about Zion. We're going to talk about Zion's people. There's a lot we're going to discover together in these, in these broadcasts. So I hope that you'll, you'll continue to watch them Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 10 a.m. Mount Zion signifies something. Zion's people. Zion always represents a people who are a, a church within a church, a people within a people, a people who can relate to the Lord fully. That's why the Lord goes there. David pitches that tent on Mount Zion for a reason, in Jerusalem for a reason. And it, he, the first thing he does is, is he establishes the presence of God to be sought after. Why is that important today? Well, that's what we're going to look at. What is the tabernacle of David? You know, many believers didn't even know that David had one. Many are familiar with the tabernacle of Moses and the, and, and the temple of Solomon, but, but are unfamiliar with David's tabernacle. I want you to think about this. God has not promised to restore the tabernacle of Moses or the temple of Solomon, but he's promised to restore the tabernacle of David. We need right now, and God is revealing the revelation of the tabernacle of David. Why? Because the tabernacle of David is what brings us into the glory realm on a corporate basis and on an individual basis. That's why the Lord told me to do the convergences, because what they are is a, it's the beginning of that forming of David's tabernacle and those that came. And that's why I want you to watch Thursday night so that you can hear what happens when we just minister to the Lord, when he was the agenda. I want you to hear how their lives were changed, how they met the Lord personally. I'm praying apostles, prophets, teachers, pastor evangelists, that you will watch Thursday night at seven o'clock central time so that you can hear. The testimonies of people who have met God face to face, what he did, what he did with their children, what he did in their hearts. And when when you're done listening, I want you to hear, you won't hear a testimony of Flame of Fire Ministries. You're not going to hear a testimony of Pastor Henry. You're going to hear a testimony of God. You're going to hear the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ and his spirit, the spirit of prophecy, were in it are in and abide in David's tabernacle type worship. This is where God can speak. Hallelujah. He didn't promise to restore Moses' tabernacle or the temple of Solomon. Why the tabernacle of David? Why now? Because if you go to an ordinary church service, Sunday and Wednesday, or even a conference, you might get a little bit more worship there. But why is the ministry to the Lord the least thing we do? I ask you, Pastor, why? I ask you, Apostle, why? I know you may not think so, but why, why is there a set time? Why is the urgency for somebody to minister? Why? Why does that? Why is that? I want you to ask that question. Why is that so needful? Where did that come from? You need to hear me. You got to hear what God's given me, the revelation that God's given me. Why is that lifted up? about being with the Lord. I just want to know. Why is that? What's the goal? What's the goal of a service? We would say to feed the sheep. I say to you, they're hardly fed. They're hardly fed that they hardly know God. They hardly know God for themselves. They hardly know how to wait on the Lord. They hardly know to hear from the Lord. They are so dependent on somebody feeding them that they don't, they've never grown up. 
and we got still young ones that should be teachers by now, fathers by now, and you get frustrated, Pastor, you get frustrated, Pastor, that they're not growing. The reason why they're not growing is not because of what they're doing wrong. It's because in the structure that we have, we're doing wrong. We're not giving them the food that they need to grow by. But this day and this hour, we're still giving them yesterday's manna. It may be a today revelation, but it's still in a yesterday manner structure. That's so hard to understand. I get it. It was hard for me to get it. It wasn't easy. If God didn't freeze me in my tracks, beloved, I would still be doing it. I'm telling you. Most of you heard that testimony. But if the Lord didn't stop me, I'd still be doing it. Because that's what I was taught. I'm not saying that we're doing it on purpose. I'm not saying that the, the leaders are, are doing something evil. It's just what we've known. It's a pattern of worship. It's a ritual act of worship. It is a pattern of worship that we have done for centuries. Some do it more, some do it less. Some have longer services, some have, but the structure is still there. And David's tabernacle, the only structure is ministry to God. The only structure is 24 hours a day, 365. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I believe God is gonna restore that very much. But the heart is to find God. Do you know my grandson's life was changed at the convergence? He got saved. My grandsons got saved. They're 11, 7, and 5, I think. They got saved at Christmas. Got them Bibles. But my oldest grandson at the convergence in Navarre said, I have never felt God like this before. I feel his peace. I'm safe here. I was, tested, he, I was talking to him the other day. His name is Ishai. Ishai. I was talking to Ishai um, the other day and about a certain situation. I said, well, how are you doing? He goes, granddaddy, since the convergence, I can hear God so much more clearly. I can pray and God is talking to me. Isn't that the testimony you want to hear, beloved pastors, prophets, apostles, teachers, and evangelists, that your children and your grandchildren hear God? They sit in our services, they go off to Sunday school, they go off to things, but do they hear God? Do they know God? Are they able to minister with you as adults? What about teenage apostles and prophets? Oh, you don't think God doesn't have some? Yes, he does. What about teenage pastors and young people? Yes, he does. God will use the young and the old. In the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters are going to prophesy and see visions. Could there possibly a teenage apostle? Yeah, I know one. He's in India. At 18 years old, God called this young man. He started 60 churches by the time he was 19. His brother's name is Isaac. What a man of God. Now he's married. He has two children. But when I first met him, he was just a teen. But he knew God, called of God, started churches, pastors. God was no respecters of persons. He kind of considers me like a spiritual father to him. I haven't heard from him because of the pandemic in India. But I'm praying that he's okay. But you see, in the tabernacle of worship, we get, we minister the heart of God. But in that, as we minister to his heart, he begins to manifest his glory. And in the glory, we get revelation. We get right understanding. We get plans and blueprints. We get timing. And we get the, we get the delivery system, how to release on earth which God does in heaven. In a church service, it's five ministers or a select few that minister. In the tabernacle, God allows and uses whom he will. Now David put singers and musicians trained, skilled to minister to the Lord. But God moved through whom he will. Handmaidens, men servants, prophets, scribes, you name it. That's why this is so important. We need that revelation of the tabernacle of David in order to understand what is taking place in the church proper today. The tabernacle of David was a temporary resting place for the ark of the Lord. It was a temporary resting place for the Ark of the Lord. That's very important. David would eventually 
and struck Solomon to build the temple. But when the Lord looked at what he needed at the last days, he didn't go back to Moses' tabernacle. He didn't want to restore Solomon's temple. He said, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David. Wow. And what was the tabernacle of David? A simple tent erected by David. If you look at Moses' tabernacle, Moses was given an exact pattern of how to build the structure. In David's tabernacle, there was no pattern of the tent. It was just a tent. However, David was given the order of worship. David was given the order of the structure of what worship is to be on earth, just like it is in heaven. Moses built a tabernacle that was a reflection of what was in heaven. But David built the tabernacle of worship, which is a reflection of heaven. Did you all get that? That's very important. Hallelujah. Is this helping anybody today? I hope so. I hope this is a blessing to you. Amen. The ark was the most important article in the tabernacle of Moses. It was the most important piece of whatever you want to call it, equipment in the tabernacle of Moses. Why? Because it represented the presence of God. The ark represented the presence and the glory of God. It was the most important. So from the outer courts into the holy place to behind the veil, the destination was the ark. The destination was the ark. And what was a priest once a year able to do? Go behind there and minister to the Lord. What happened when Jesus was crucified and gave up his breath? The veil was torn in two. The opening unto the Holy of Holies was open for us to come in. Why? To be with God and to minister with the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It represented the presence of God that dwells in the midst of his people. The ark is referred to by many different titles in the Old Testament. The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord in Numbers 10.33, the Ark of the Lord God in 1 Kings 2.26, the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth in Joshua 3.13, the Ark of God in 1 Samuel 3.3, 3, the Holy Ark, 2 Chronicles 35.3, the Ark of thy strength, Psalm 132.8, the Ark of the Covenant of God, Judges 20.27, the Ark of the Covenant, Joshua 3.6, the Ark of the Lord, Joshua 4.11, the Ark of God and the God of Israel, 1 Samuel 5.7, and the Ark of Shittim, S-H-I-T-T-I-M, would, Exodus 25.10. Those are all the expressions of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark was made of Shittim wood, and it was overlaid with gold within and without. Moses was commanded to make the Ark, Exodus 25.10. There is an Ark in heaven, Revelations 11.19. The Ark made by Moses, listen carefully, was the earthly representation of that which is in heaven. The ark represents the throne of God. The ark represents the throne of God. That's what the tabernacle of David is about. It is to go behind the veil into the throne room of God. Everyone that came to the virgins went to that throne room, experienced the throne room, and was changed by the glory of God in that throne room. Why would we stop God's people from coming into the throne room in our services? Why would we stop them in our conferences from coming to the throne room of God? Why do we want them to meet the people who minister to the Lord instead of the Lord himself? I'm just going to let that sit there for a minute. Why are we more interested in bringing them to the people that minister to the Lord than to the Lord himself? You know, when the Lord told me, Henry, I don't want you to build a church. I don't want you to build a ministry, but I want you to establish the kingdom of God's and men's hearts. He said, Henry, I want you to take their hand, lift them up into my hand. And when they grab a hold of it, let go and get out of the way. Yeah, I have a function and that's to do exactly that. Bring people to the Lord, to find the Lord from themselves. And when they get a hold of the Lord themselves, get out of the way. Be there for them if they need any guidance as God would allow. But I'm not the destination. 
Flame of Fire is not the destination. Your church is not their destination. That's a hard concept, isn't it? Your conferences are not the destinations, the throne room. The throne of God is our destination, and that's where we must lead people to. That's what David's tabernacle is being reestablished to do, to bring people back to their throne room relationship with God. The throne room activity of God, because we are not going to be an overcoming people, a victorious people, beloved, if we don't learn how to live and move from the throne room of God as David did. David was a king that was in so harmony with God that everything that he did was established by the Lord and he released on earth that which is in heaven. I think this is beautiful. I don't know about you. But if we're going to transition out of services, you know, into the kingdom gatherings, we've got to look at where we are at, what it does, and why it cannot work now. And I know I get a lot of flack over this because, I mean, you start touching church services, man, pastors, leaders, they get very upset. And I, I ask myself, why? Why are they getting so upset? Because that's what we do. Our identity is not in Christ. Our identity is in our function. That was a word. Our identity is not in Christ. It's in our function, our functioning of Christ, our ministry gift of Christ, our, our ministry, our church. That's our identity. And that's wrong. Our identity is to be in Christ. And if our identity is really found in Christ, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what our part is. But we begin to see the bigger parts, not just five ministry parts, but the whole body parts. That is so critical for us to grasp. I am praying that God would bring apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists that will have that heart and bring us together so that we can converge with God's people together and function together as one people of God. That's what I'm longing for where we're not longing to bring a new revelation, a new teaching, or try to build something with these hands, but to allow the Lord to build us into something, a kingdom, to build us into a kingdom of priests and kings unto God, to build us into a royal priesthood and a holy nation so that we can rule and reign with them. That burns within me. And I believe it's burning in those of you that are watching this broadcast. Amen. Amen. The ark represents the throne of God in the earth. The ark of the covenant represented the throne of God in earth. It was a governmental establishment. But think about it. It represented the glory and the presence of God. Notice government and glory are one and the same. Government and glory and presence are the same. Why are we dissecting it, believers? Why are we trying to establish apostolic government without God's, without the ark? Why? Why isn't the ark important? Why isn't the glory of God and the presence of God from his perspective important? Not what we think it is, but what he says it is. Isn't, isn't that the right perspective, beloved? Praise God. It was the ark that the high priest sprinkled the blood of atonement once a year in Leviticus 16 and Hebrews 9, 7. God dwells between the cherubim. Upon the ark, Psalm 81, God dwells between those two cherubims, which were the symbol of his glory. That's where the mercy seat was surrounded by two cherubims. Symbols of winged glory. Hebrews 9 talks about this. Wait till we get to Hebrews 9 and 10. I can't wait to get there with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The ark represents Jesus Christ who is the fullness of the God of, of the Godhead and bodily form. The Ark of the Covenant is the most important. I'm going to quote this man named Kevin Connors. He said this. He said, the Ark of the Covenant is the most important piece of furniture in the Old Testament. God places such a great importance on it that there are more references to the Ark than to any other piece of furniture. Hmm. For this reason, a closer study of the history of the Ark is warranted. In fact, it will be seen that the history of the Ark is, is prophetic of the history of the New Testament. That's right. And that's why the Ark moves in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. 
The unfolding of the full purpose of the ark, the throne room of God is what the book of Revelation is all about. So you got to understand why David's tabernacle is so critical because it's what houses the ark. Praise God. Praise God. As the ark was first and foremost in Israel's history, so Jesus Christ is first is first and preeminent in all things before the Father and in the church, Colossians 1, 17 through 19. The journeying of the ark, the journeying of the ark, and that's a really important thing, the journeying, journeying of the ark. Donna and I used to you know, call our traveling, since 2004, we've been prayer missionaries, prophetic missionaries, classical missionaries, whatever you wanna call us. And we call it a mission trip. I don't know, Donna, when we got this and a few years ago, but the Lord said, it's not a mission trip. It's a journey. Matter of fact, so much, I had to get this mug. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? The journey? He said, you're on a journey. Now we get it. Because what God is asking us to do as we travel is to bring that ark to pitch a tent for that ark to manifest. And we it started in Navarre and went to Colorado. Now we're going to Plymouth, Massachusetts, this time for six days. Three days of as we have done, but an additional three days because that ark, that traveling ark, needs to be taken and, and, and brought places around that area. That's all I'm going to tell you. That's all I know so far, whatever that means. So I hope that, you, that you, you'll come. I'm going to do a special Thursday night broadcast about it. And then I'm going to do a Zoom video, private Zoom video with those that are thinking about coming to the convergence. It started in 9, well, Donna wrote it down in 9, 20, 25, 17. We called the journey. When I had to get a new car, I, I was picking between two cars and there's a car called the journey, Dodge journey. It's got less stuff than I like in it, but I had to get the journey. And when I went to Colorado, the Lord said, a, a, a new journey for the journey. And so I believe God is doing something. Even my car is called a journey. <laughs> the journeying of the ark speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ in his birth, his anointing, his life, his ministry, his death, resurrection, his glorification, and his second coming. So it's a journey all the way to the present day. Now, let's take a look at a little bit of history as we begin to close out this broadcast about Shiloh. And this man, I'm going to read to you 1 Samuel 1, 3. And this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of, two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. After the wilderness journeying, the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh. Why Shiloh? We'll see. This is a place where Hannah prayed and made a vow to the Lord. If you give me a son, he's yours. I came into this world by my mom's prayer because we lost my brother died after three days old when he was perfectly healthy. And the Lord said, Lord, if you give me another son, he's yours. That was her Shiloh moment. Shiloh is a place where the young prophet Samuel, what happens there, begins to hear the voice of God. So what gets restored at Shiloh? The voice of God. These traveling tents are almost like a Shiloh moment, Shiloh moment where we begin to hear the presence of God. God bless you, Scott, for joining today and all of you that joined if I didn't greet you. Now, the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they were wicked and they were corrupt priests. They, listen carefully, despise the holy things of God. They despise them. They took them for granted. This is a serious warning. How can a church in the church age become a Laodicean church, lukewarm, ready to be spewed out of the mouth of God? How can a church leadership in this nation and nations believe we are rich in need of nothing 
and not see the true state of themselves and the church in these last days. Because we glorify in, on the numbers of people that come, we glorify in our services where we have to hear a message instead of glorifying God. Our gatherings are not to hear a message. It's to, it's to be with God and to be with the message and be with the messenger who will then bring that message of what we need to hear through a multi-membered body of Christ, including a pastor, Bible minister, and you, so that you can hear directly from God. Shiloh was a place that Samuel heard the voice of the Lord. But Phineas and his brother Eli, Eli, they just, uh, uh, not Eli, Phineas and, what was the guy's name? I forgot it. Sorry. Hophni, Hophni and Phineas. They despised the holy things of God. That would bring judgment upon the house of Eli. I won't tell you what's happening in our nation right now. I'm not even going to go there. But if you see what's happening in our nation, I wonder if the Lord sees Phineas and Hophni and Eli. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, I'm going to read 1 Samuel 4, 3 through 5, 10 and 11. I want you to hear it from the word of God. I want to bring you a scriptural foundation to what I'm sharing with you. So that people say, oh, you just want to worship the Lord. And no, 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 no. Yes, I want to worship the Lord, but you don't understand the value of D David's tabernacle. Okay. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, where has the Lord, why, wherefore has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Okay. Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh onto us that when it comes amongst us, it may save us out of the hands of the enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelleth uh, between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of God came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout. So the earth, it says the earth rang again. Now, what happens? They understood the enemy was coming. They needed the ark or the symbol of the presence of God. But what they didn't see was that because of the, of Eli and Phineas and Hophni despising the holy things of God, the ark in itself was not going to save them. Listen, it says, and the Philistines fought with Israel and the Israel and, and the Philistine fought and Israel was smitten and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a great, very great slaughter, slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. I think this is one of Israel's biggest defeats ever. 30,000 footmen died. But yet they had the Ark of the Covenant. They brought it out. And the Ark of God was taken captive. The ark of God was taken captive. And the two sons of, Is, Isai, uh, of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. This is where we see the ark was at Shiloh. But because the priesthood was not functioning and corrupt, did you hear what I just said? They were not functioning. The ministry to God was not important. They were greedy. They were selfish. They were self-seekers. And they did not truly desire the holy things of God or take care of them. That's pretty profound, isn't it? So they were defeated. So the ark was taken by the Philistines. This was one of the most tragic defeats of Israel. The Israelites presumed, just like we do today, just like we do today in many places, we presume that the ark would assure them victory. They lost the battle and the ark. Oh my God, it's all over me. They lost the battle and the ark. You say you're rich and you are in need of nothing, but I say you're poor, blind, pitiable, and naked. I know your works. I know they're more numerous than they are in the beginning, Ephesus. I know you try them who say that they are apostles and they're not but I have this one charge against you. You have deserted me, your first love. Repent from the heights of which you have fallen 
or else I will come quickly and I will remove my lampstand, the symbol of my presence from your midst, unless you repent. See how serious it is? Our first love and our first ministry to the Lord is. Do you see why when we go to church and we go to church services, and I've done them like this as well, our focus is not meeting the Lord. It is getting a message. It's about hearing a message because we want to be fed the word instead of being with the word who will feed us. That's why the convergences take us out of that church service structure so that we can begin to experience the David Tabernacle structure where each one can meet the Lord. I'm not saying this to be critical of pastors, anybody who does services. I realize that's what we do right now. I'm saying we're changing from that to something greater. That's all I'm saying. I did services for years. Donna would tell you. Then we did encounter God meetings, which were much more deeper in the Lord. But now this gathering of the saints together where Jesus is going to be glorified is not like anything we have seen or heard or experienced before. Today, I'm beginning just to lay some scriptural, structural background so that you can see. And if anybody wants to say, where's that in the Bible? I'm showing you where it's in the Bible so that you know where it is and why this is so important. Because we're going to look at the journey of the ark so we can see where we're going. We can see prophetically where we are today and why this is so important to the Lord. I wish my, my FIFO brothers would, and, and I don't say this superior to anyone, would just open up to say, listen, maybe let's try this. Brother, come. Maybe we don't know how to do it. Come. Will you do it? And let's just gather together. Let's just worship the Lord. And let's work with our singers, our musicians, and let's just meet the Lord. And let's gather the apostles and the FIFO ministers together in that atmosphere with God's people. And let's just see what happens. No agenda. No guest speakers, just the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. It is so new. It is so novel. That's why I'm going to be teaching and sharing it. As a forerunner, maybe, God is using me at least to proclaim it and demonstrate it to the best that I'm able to do it by the grace of God. That maybe, eventually, this will catch on fire and begin to gather us together in the assembly of God's people so that God can be in the midst of us and we can be his people. I'm just going to go a few more minutes, okay? Let's just finish up about on, on this about uh, on this section. All right. Now, the, they lost the battle in the ark. You know what happened? Eli fell backwards and broke his neck when he heard the news. His daughter-in-law went into travail with child upon ear, hearing the news. She named her son Ichabod meaning the glory is departed from Israel or the glory of the Lord has departed. You see, the glory is what the ark symbolizes. The ark of the covenant symbolizes the glory and the manifested presence of God. And when it's valued, the Lord is there. When it's not, the tools are there. The instrument of the ark, but it didn't save them because the God who sits on the ark wasn't with them. And that's what he says today. You say you're rich and need him nothing. But I say. If you read Revelation chapter two and three, you will see the sin that's in the house of God and the need to repent and change. If we're going to be a royal priesthood, be formed into a royal priesthood and a holy nation, if we're going to be overcomers for these end times. You can begin to see, understand why we need a fresh revelation of Jesus as the Omega God. As in Revelation chapter one, Jesus, John sees Jesus as the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. He sees the finisher and the beginning. We see the lamb and the lion on the throne in the book of Revelation. We see an overcoming position and we see the glory realm unfolding to us in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is all about the unfolding glory. That's why the series is called Unfolding Glory. That glory that's going to come and transform this earth, the kingdoms of this earth into the kingdoms of our God in Christ. We are to be a glory filled people. We're being called to arise and shine for our light is come and the glory of God shall be seen what risen upon us. So if we don't understand the glory or how God glory comes, and if we don't understand David's tabernacle, is, is a key for the Lord to bring forth his glory. If we don't understand that we're to be a personal David's tabernacle where we can be filled individually with the glory, a family tabernacle where we can be filled with our family with the glory of God, and then a collective body of Christ 
as a tabernacle of David, we will never understand the functioning, the workings of glory. We will not be ready for what's coming. We will not be prepared, prepared, positioned, equipped, and propelled with glory because we don't know the ministry to the Lord. We know the work of God, but we don't know the ministry to the Lord. Our relationship to be one with the Lord so we can hear him clearly, distinctly. Psalm 32, 8, I, I, will, I, the Lord, will teach you and instruct you in the ways that you should go, and I will guide you with my own eye. That is the glory realm of God. So let's wrap this up here. She named her son Ichabod, the glory of the Lord departed. The ark of God represents the glory of God. The ark of God represents the glory of God. I know we hear so much teachings about the glory, but the ark of God represents the glory. The ark of God, the place where he sits, the throne room. I was in a meeting in New York. I was, it was called, um, uh, I forgot what it's called. Something about the fire. Keep the fire burning or something. I was asked to minister there with with a with a another uh, prophetic psalmist musician, Ruth Fossil, and they had the flags, they had the ministry, and they brought the cross, and everybody came and they were at the cross. All the people there were saved, but up on the altar was this big huge beautiful banner flag, and it had the throne room of God and King Jesus sitting on it. And the Lord told me four times, get out of your seat and go hug that banner. Oh, Lord, you're going to get me in big trouble here because I'm, I'm, I'm just a guest speaker. He said, go up there and hug that banner. And so after the fourth time, I obeyed the Lord. I'm sorry it took me so long, but I went up there and I hugged the banner and I stayed there. And even after the worship was over, the, the pastor started speaking. I'm hugging the banner. And then finally... You know, I, 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 I was able to let go of the banner and I took one young musician. I said, we're just going to sing one song to the Lord together, you and I. Let's sing to the Lord and minister to him. And then when I got done, I said, just sit here. Just stay there. And then I sat down on the front of the altar area. And this is what the Lord told me. He said, the church is still living at the cross. The cross is the doorway in. The destination is the throne. The throne room where my glory is because my children are to be filled with my glory that's why you hug that flag tell them they must go past the cross never forget it always appreciate it always preach it but the destination is the throne that's what the book of revelation chapter one through five is all about praise god the ark of god represents the glory of god when the ark departs, so does the glory, Ichabod. When the ark departs, to departs, that's my New England accent, I'm sorry. The glory departs. So think about our present day church system and, and services. Where is the glory of God? That's all I'm asking you. Where is it? Where is the manifested glory in the meetings, in the conferences? I'm not talking about his presence. I'm talking about his glory. There's the presence of the Lord in the holy place. And God can heal, set free, deliver, save, and the gifts of the Spirit operate. But where's the glory? The glory is when you can't minister. The glory is when each person is individually with the Lord and you lose consciousness of everybody else around you. And God is personally dealing with you and speaking with you. And then collectively, where is that glory? You can hardly see it and find it in a church service today because he's not welcome. Because we stopped at the holy place. We stay in the holy place ministry. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to really unfold Hebrews chapter 9. God gave me this by divine revelation. Hebrews chapter 9. And you test it. But it's all through the scriptures. And why the glory is not seen. And why is God transitioning us from services to the tabernacle of David. And why the convergence is a bridge for us to experience it. To build it. To rebuild it. So this becomes the heart of the church, the heartbeat of the church, so that God's glory can be in the midst of his people. Don't we want God's glory to be seen in the midst of you personally, in the midst of your family, in the midst of the church proper? Thank you, Lord. The ark of the Lord represents the glory of God. 
When the ark of the Lord departs, beloved, so does the glory. Israel was ordained. Isn't this good? To be the keepers of the ark. Israel was ordained to be the keeper of the ark. I just want you to set that. Oh my God, I could cry when I say this. You have not chosen me, but I have a change. I have chosen you and I have ordained you to bring forth fruit. And that your fruit would remain, Jesus said. They were ordained as the keepers of the ark. They were chosen by God to be blessed with his presence. No other nation had that privilege, and they don't today, except for the church. The Philistines were not ordered to be the keepers of the ark. When they brought the ark into, ark into their land, tremendous judgments followed. The ark of God would never return to Shiloh. Where would it end up? In the tabernacle of David. The Philistines would return the ark after experiencing the judgments of God. So the ark of God was a means of blessing to God's people when they valued it and they valued his manifested presence and it brought judgments upon the nation. That's all I'm going to say. It brought judgments, cleansing judgments upon the nations. The glory of God does what? It brings blessings to God's people and judgments to the nations. Psalm 149. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a double-edged sword in their hand. Read it so that they can execute the judgments written. So the ark and the glory bring blessings and they bring judgments. The glory brings blessings and it brings judgments. And what is Jesus going to do? Judge what? The nations? What's he going to do? Judge his church first, then the nations? Do you see it? Maybe that's one of the reasons why there isn't a desire for God's glory, because he would have to judge us. He'd have to judge our works. He'd have to judge our churches. He'd have to judge our motives. He'd have to judge our services. He'd have to judge what we're doing. And maybe what we're doing, he won't like it. And maybe we don't want to hear that. The ark brings blessings to God's people and judgments to the nations. That's powerful, isn't it? Oh, praise God. All right. Thank you, Lord. Tomorrow we're going to continue on the journey of the ark to the tabernacle. This is so important to see. Today we see what happened at Shiloh. The Shiloh was a place of the voice of the Lord. That's where Samuel was born. Samuel was born after a promise given to, 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 um, to Hannah. And he was set apart in Shiloh to hear the voice of the Lord because the present leadership could not and would not hear the voice of the Lord. They were corrupted. Am I saying every minute? No, I'm not. I'm saying, but there is a system that has been, been corrupted that has become work oriented instead of God oriented. It's become working for God oriented more than it is being with God oriented. So tomorrow we'll continue with the journey of the ark. And tomorrow we're going to talk, and I can't even say this word correctly, it's Kurt, Kurt Joth Jerem. <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about. The men of Kurt Joth Jerem. K-I-R-J-A-T-H-J-E-A-R-I-M. We're talk about them, how they fetched up the ark of the Lord and what they did with it. So I hope this is a blessing. I hope we're beginning to see what it, our church services and our structure, what they, what they have done. We have met the Lord there. God saved us there. We got healed there. We got delivered there. We got the baptism of the Holy Spirit there. So I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. We got fed there. We got milk there. But what we didn't get there was the glory. What we didn't get there was to go beyond the beyond behind the veil. And that's why the church age, which represents a holy place, has come to the end. Our journey now is behind the veil into the deep throne room of God so that we can function with him as a wheel within a wheel. A man-child company, a bride, full-grown sons and daughters that are equipped, who know how to minister to the heart of God. And the heart of God and their ministry to them is their first work as a priest and a bride 
so that God can now function, Jesus can function in their eyes on this earth as a as a king, as a king and a son. It's priest bride first, king son second. That's what these videos are going to help us see, understand, I pray, and I hopefully it will transform our lives. Hopefully it will reach those that are doing meetings, whether you're a home group leader or whether you're a, a small church or a large church, there is a place for the ark of God to be in our midst if we will seek him. If we will seek him, we'll find him. Let me close out with my two of my favorite scriptures from Proverbs 8, verses 17 and 21. This is God speaking. He says, I love them that love me. And those who seek me, early and diligently, they shall find me. And those that I love, I cause them to inherit true riches. Amen. And I fill their treasuries with glory. I added the with glory, but he fills their treasuries. Father, we thank you for this broadcast this morning. Thank you for this journey that you would teach us the journey of the ark. And Lord, why? You said that in the last days, you're not going to rebuild the tabernacle of Moses or the temple of Solomon, but you're going to rebuild the tabernacle of David in that day. In that day, I will rebuild its ancient ruins. In that day, I will rebuild its fallen booths. You said in that day, Jesus, I will be seen. I will come and I will be seen glorified in my saints. In that day, Lord, and we're in that day. I pray such a release, such a strengthening, such an impartation, Lord, that you would unfold this mystery and this revelation, Lord, of the rebuilding of this tabernacle through these divine convergences, God, so that, Lord, you can gather us together from every tribe and every nation and cities and towns and, and to come together to be with you, that where you alone are being sought after, you are being ministered to. And out of that, as David received instructions and directions and plans in Israel, and you established your governmental order out of Jerusalem, out of that place of meeting with you, so shall it be again, be established in your remnant people in your house, Lord. And Lord, now to you who can do exceedingly above all that we ask or think, to you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Now, as you see, I'm giving some historical content to this, and I want you to see it scripturally. I want to give you the scriptural references to it so that you can see that you know, where this is in the word of God. So I hope that was a, a help and encouragement to you this morning. I do want to invite you, August 6th to the 11th, if you are a worshiper th that understands David's tabernacle, whether at home or in a church or a host group or a dancer, a singer, a musician, a scribe, a prophetic intercessor, an apostolic fivefold ministry, a saint of God on fire for the Lord, I want to invite you to Plymouth, Massachusetts, August 6th through the 11th, okay? Amen. I can't put it up because I don't, I, I, unless somebody wants to type it in for me. It's August 6th to the 11th at Plymouth, Massachusetts at the um, Hilton Garden Inn. We're going to meet there for six days. And for the first three days, we're going to minister to the Lord in that place as we have done and, and hear the instruction of the Lord. The second three days, we're going to continue to minister to the Lord, but some are going to be taken out to be sent to continue to seek the Lord just at different places. And I believe God is going to do something miraculous in all of our lives at this convergence, August 6th through the 11th. All the details are on our website at www.flamaflyer2007.org. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to type it in myself. Right, the flame. Uh, just bear with me. Listen, as spaces are are going uh, are. Are limited so please come that you and you find it on the event page and this is the plymouth my mouth yeah Got it wrong okay. i put something in there i can't my screen is so far away sorry guys my convergence August 
2021. You can register online, save your space, and we have a, a discounted roommate. Now, this is peak vacation season there. So our roommate is almost $80 cheaper than normal. So it is a very good rate, right? There are restaurants all around, and it's a beautiful place and a good place to be. It's in Plymouth, Massachusetts, right where this nation was founded. So we invite you to come. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you for watching this broadcast. I really appreciate you being here. I hope it was a blessing to you. And I just, I'm, I'm asking. Okay. Thank you, Lord. I don't know if there's anybody still on anymore. Praise God. I can't tell. Yeah. Anyways, um, if you would like to, um, and you're watching this for the first time, people ask me, how can I be a blessing to you? If you'd like to bless us, you know, financially, you can if you choose to. And we have a website, at which is up there. We also have a PayPal account. I just posted. And we appreciate it. as missionaries, we need God to touch people like you. If the Lord sows to sow, not so, but to bless us. And we appreciate every one of you that have been blessing us. Every seed, every prayer, every word of encouragement. I say it every broadcast because I want you to know how important that is to us. That you pray for us, that you encourage us, and you bless us financially. This is how we live by the grace of God. And we thank God for that. Also, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to need to raise quite a bit of money to get up to, to, to this convergence. So if God would touch any of you, heart, and you would like to be a, 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 a partner with me in this, or you'd like to be a, um, you know, I need, um, um, God always shows me in a simple number. He says, you need 10 people to sow this amount or 12 people. Now, it doesn't always come that way. He just shows me, Henry, can you believe that I got 10 people in the whole wide world? The whole wide world, you know how many people there are, Henry, that can hear me, that could bless you with this, this, this amount of blessing? I say, yes, Lord. So there are people, okay, that, that God can touch that would like to be a sponsor, so to speak, if you want to use the word, or a partner with us, which is probably a better word, in partnership, in, in love bonds. If you'd like to be one, uh, you know, or if you think you can, just send me a, a message, and then I will tell you personally, because I'm, I'm not asking everybody. I'm asking for those who God touches to see if they would love to, one, you know, um, be part with us to help us get there. All right? Praise God. Well, thank you. God bless you. It was so wonderful being with you. I miss being with everybody today. Everybody on there, Nicole and Scott, and I don't know who else is on, Patricia, Donna, uh, who else, Katie, and Le uh, Leisha from Fiji. Scott, thank you for all joining today. Amen. And please keep Reverend Lynn in your prayers. We'll talk to you tomorrow, same time, same station. Thank you for watching. God bless you, everyone. We love you all. Bye-bye.